teacher conference this Tuesday, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday night. We'll be here till eight o'clock in the evening. So grab a parent, drag them on up here, say howdy. Or maybe your parents gonna grab you and drag you up here. I don't know. But anyway, we'd love to uh, love to see some parents tomorrow. Uh, if they got questions or just want to meet all the teachers, we'll be up here and uh, can discuss any questions they got, anything going on. Could tell them how wonderful you're doing in Algebra 3, hopefully. See, I'm still working on grading. Hopefully everyone's doing wonderfully. Uh, if you haven't finished some of the Module 1, get that done because we're not going to be in Module 2 very long. So you need to stay on top of things. So, that being said, let's see what we got to cover. I have rearranged it a little bit, so hopefully it's not going to be like crazy. But let's let's get things going here. All right. So if we look at uh, Buzz, go to our grade screen as usual. I'm behind. I didn't have my stuff turned in, but you should have 2.01, 2.02 turned in. I have not, as you can see, it's red, it's past due. I did not have it turned in on time. So I need to get those turned in, but that's where we're at. Uh, this week, we're going to do building functions from functions, and we're going to do inverse functions. All right, and we talked a little bit about some of this before, but we're going to get into it pretty good here. And then I've moved the graphing to next week with the test. We just have uh, just the test next week, which there's a practice test that you can make sure you're ready. But graphing is a, a simpler lesson, so I just moved it into next week. So we don't have to do three this week. So next week we'll do one lesson, and you'll have the test. So 2.03, 2.04 this week. Let's hop on it. Functions from functions. And I go, okay, Mr. Brock, sounds like you're getting kind of crazy on this. Functions from functions. Yeah, I got this one bigger on the screen starting out now, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but let's look at the scenic overlook. Remember, this unit looks different than the last one. Everything's on one page, but it's 12 pages long. It's just all one big Google Doc. And we cover the scenic overlook, which is very short. That's it, because here's where the actual textbook starts the lesson. So we're going to learn about the different ways to combine functions. So we're going to look at... Two functions can be combined by the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's why the scenic overlook is so short. We can do that pretty simply uh, on, on one page of the overlook, but we're going to do some examples of this together. So in the quotient example, if you had f of x divided by g of x, we have to restrict g of x because... If that's a fraction, you can have zero. So g of x cannot be zero. So there's certain conditions like that where we will have to do some restrictions of the domain or some restrictions of the function. But let's look at how we do this. Uh, let's see, where are we going right there? So the, the best way to learn this concept is to by working through examples. In your online textbook, which is, there's many examples down here if you need more examples. We're going to work some examples ourselves. But if you need more, there's a bunch of them down there. So let's look at the sum, the difference, the product, and the quotient. And how do we do that? Okay, so we're going to start with the sum. And I'm going to put up this paper here so we can just do some examples. So if f of x is x squared and g of x is the square root of x plus 1. So let's talk about the different things we can do. We can do f plus g of x, which basically just means we take f of x and we add g of x to it. So let's do that. f plus g of x would equal f of x, right here, x squared, plus g of x, plus the square root of x plus 1. We would simplify if we could, but that's it. This is an x squared, and that's a square root of x plus 1. Those cannot be combined, so that's it. 
So let's look at f minus g of x. So that just means we take f of x and we subtract g of x. So f minus g of x is just x squared minus square root of x plus 1. Cannot be simplified. Again, that's as simple as it gets. Um, f times g of x just means we take f of x and we multiply it times g of x. Right, so f times g of x is the same thing as taking x squared times the square root of x plus 1. That's it. That's simplified. There's, there's nothing else we can do to that. Unless we know what the value of x is, then we can put x in there and simplify. But uh, as it stands, x squared times x plus 1. And then finally... F divided by G of X means we take F of X and divide it by G of X. So F divided by G of X equals X squared square root of X plus 1. And in this case, we cannot have a zero because this is a fraction. You cannot divide by zero. So X cannot be. Well, it would make that zero, right? If X is negative one, negative one plus one is zero. The square root is zero, zero. X cannot be negative one. Or we're going to, you know, that's the same thing as saying G of X cannot be zero. But since we know what g of x is, we know that if x was negative 1, that would make g of x 0. g of x cannot be 0. So x cannot be negative 1. And that's all it takes on that. The other thing they talk about is f, and they put a hollow circle, f of g of x. You say that f of g, f of g, f of g of x, that's the same thing as taking the f and substituting g of x in for x. So in this case, f of g of x would mean we're going to take the g and substitute it in for the x. So this would be parentheses, the square root of x plus 1 squared. We can simplify that because if you have the square root and squared, those cancel each other out. So it just equals x plus 1. So that's what f of g of x equals in this case is just x plus 1 because the square root and the squared cancel each other out. Now, remember, you can also do the other way, g of f of x. And in that case, we substitute x into there. So that would be the square root of x squared plus 1, which is simplified. You can't simplify that any further. x squared plus 1 under the square root. So let me leave that there for a second. For those of you taking notes, the, the main thing is to know what, what does that mean? That means you're just adding them together. What does that mean? That means you're just subtracting them. That just means you're multiplying them. And, and that means you divide the actual functions. And f of g means you're going to substitute g into the f where the x is. So that's the nice big picture look at it with a with a simple example you say simple but it's got a square root in it but that just means we couldn't simplify our answers but all we did is we just added them together subtracted them multiplied them or oh, i guess i should divide this up 
or divided them. We can look at another example or two in our text. And everything we have right there, this is the same thing. F plus G of X is F of X plus G of X. So there's the exact same thing that I just wrote without the example. That's the left column that I did. All right. Oh, let's see. Oh, here's the, yeah, here's the overview. And then it has the F of G of X where you substitute that. So let's see if there's any other examples we want to look at right here. Uh, there was the example we just did. Oh, and they list the domain negative one to infinity just because you cannot have a negative number. So the domains, you use the domain of whatever the restriction is. So all of these have the domain from negative one to infinity. The only difference is you cannot include negative one on here because you can have the square root of zero. Let's see, this one has a parentheses instead of a bracket because you can't have a zero when it's on the bottom of the fraction because that's dividing by one, by zero. You can't divide by zero. Because this one says give the domain of each. So that's why that's there, give the domain of each. Uh, there's the composition where you substitute one to the other. So let's see. Here's some other examples using e to the x and the square root of x. So they're doing f of g and g of x. G of f, g of f, f of g and g of f. So if you substitute the square root of x in for the x, it'd be e to the square root of x. If you substitute the other way around, the square root of e to the x, that's the that's the f of g of x and g of f of x. Uh, let's see some more examples. Finding the domains. They're big on the domains in here, so we're going to talk about that a lot. Uh, oh, this is a good one. We should write decomposing functions. We should do one of those. We should do one of those because I know you have one of these somewhere on the assignments, either in the assignment or the test or both. I don't remember. But let's write one down. So let's say that h of x equals the square root of x to the third plus one. I'm going to do that that sample problem right here. Okay, so let's say it gave us this. h of x equals square root of x to the third plus one. And it says find f of x and g of x so that h of x would equal f of g of x. So it gave us h of x. And let's say instead of h of x, this was f of g of x. Which means we had an f of x and we substituted g of x in it and we ended up with this. And here's the nice thing. There, there's more than one answer here. Let's see if we can find one. So if f of x equals this, g of x equals this, we would end up with that when we substitute g of x in. So let's see. If f of x equaled the square root of x and g of x equaled x to the third plus 1, The square root was the square root of x, f of x was the square root of x, and g of x was x to the third plus one. If we substitute g of x in for x, we would get that. Wouldn't we? If we take the x and we substitute, this would go in for the x. That would give us that right there. Now, that's not the only answer. You could give a different answer. You're like, oh, that's not what I was thinking, Mr. Brock. Well, that's fine. Your answer may be right, too. Because we could also say if f of x equaled the square root of x plus 1, 
and g of x equaled x to the third. Would we still get the same thing? If we took this and substituted it in for the x, this would become x to the third plus one. We'd still get the same thing. So there's more than one way to do it sometimes. So either one of these would be correct for this problem. Find f of x and g of x so that h of x would be the same as substituting g of x into f. And I know you're going to have a problem like that on the test or on the assignment this week or both. I don't remember. I haven't looked at the assignment. Does that make sense what we're doing? We're trying to say f of g of x would equal this. So break it apart. How did we get that? How did we get that? What did we substitute into f from g to end up with this? And that's what we got. So more than one way to do it a lot of times. A lot of times there's more than one way to do it. But that was just extra examples they gave in there. So, all right. And that is, that's as quick as that lesson is. It's just adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. You just take the functions and do what it said. Let's look at the problem. Uh, here it gives you f of x. It gives you g of x. And it says add them together. If you add them together, which one of these do you get? Here's f of x and g of x. It says add them together. This one says, oh, fg, multiply. This one says fg, multiply. Uh, this one's a divide. And what would be the proper domain if you divide? Because you cannot have zero on the bottom, right? The, num the denominator cannot be zero. The numerator can, but the denominator cannot be zero. So which one of these is correct? Uh, F divided by G again. So here's another problem like that. And the last one is F of G of X. Okay, so it's on the test where we have the H of X thing that I just showed you. So if this is F of X and this is G of X, what do you get when you substitute G of X in for the X and simplify? And simplify. Simplifying may be the hardest part of that one because it's a square root. Both of those are square roots. So you simplify. All right. Eight problems this week. Eight problems. All right. Let's look at the second lesson. Inverse functions. We've studied functions throughout this chapter. We learned a function can be shown as a set of ordered pairs. Uh, a function of x will be written as f of x equals 2x. But let's talk about the inverse function. So let's talk about a, a set of ordered pairs. All right, so let's do that. And it used f of x equals 2x. So if we use that same function, if this is our function, f of x equals 2x, then the ordered pairs we could write, if we just choose some ordered pairs, uh, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, and we could keep going. But let's say this is our set of ordered pairs. All right. And we'll just call it set A. 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, 4, 8. Because for every X, the y equals two times that. Two times one is two. Two times two is four. Two times three is six. So these are all points that if we graph this function, these are all points that would be on that function. All right. We agree with that. So the inverse, or it's kind of like saying the opposite, the inverse would contain these. Two one. Put commas between all those. Uh, four two. Six three. Eight four. 
the inverse of this function would have these points. Where notice the y became the x and the x became the y in every case. The inverse has the exact opposite. So if I gave you a set of pairs and said, what's the inverse? All you have to do is reverse them. Make the x into the y and the y into the x. Don't overcomplicate that. So that's what they're showing. If we reverse the coordinates, we create the inverse function. So if we solve that algebraically, so this would be the inverse function. We write it like that. In function notation, this is the inverse function notation, right? That's the inverse function notation. So to solve that, if you remember the steps, first we change it to y equals 2x. That's step one. Then we trade places with the x and y. Oh, that's interesting. Trade places with the x and y. We did that here. We also do that when we find the inverse. Then we solve for y. y equals 2 divided by x. And then we can write that as inverse function. So that is the inverse of this. And if we graph this, we'll find these points. If we graph this, we'll find these points. Let's, let's check that out. Let's actually do that. Because finding the inverse should have the points that we Calculated for it. And we did the points before we did the function. So f of x, we said, equaled 2x. And we said it has the points 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, and 4, 8. And let's, there's all those points. Now, we said these points should be there on the inverse, 2, 1. 4, 2, 6, 3, and 8, 8, 4, because we just reversed all the points. So let's, let's put that equation that we found as the inverse, which was 2 divided by x. Or did I do that backwards? It's x divided by 2, and it, I did that wrong. Nobody pointed that out to me. x divided by 2. We were dividing by 2, not, not divided by x. 2 divided by x. Oh, wait. What was x divided by 2? That was it. I still put the wrong thing. So the inverse was x divided by 2. And look, there's those points all on there. So don't let me do that wrong. I divided by 2 and I put it upside down. x divided by 2. So it should be the x on top, two on bottom. x divided by two, not two divided by x. x divided by two. And there's x divided by two. And all of those points are there. Now remember, when you have the inverse, it actually is a reflection of the line y equals x. Is that line in the middle, y equals x. It's a reflection over that line. That's how we know it's the inverse on a graph. It reflects over that line which means all the X's and the Y's trade places. The one becomes the Y, the two becomes the X, the four becomes the X, the two becomes the Y. Let's see, all the points are reversed on the inverse function. So, and that's how we found it algebraically. Remember those steps? I know we did that in algebra two as well, but if you need those steps, first thing you do is you change it to y equals instead of f equals second thing you do is you replace the x and the y opposite directions then you solve for y y equals the x trades place with the y solve for y 
and then rewrite. Okay, so first we make it y equals, then we trade x and y, solve for y, and then you rewrite it back as inverse function. Notation there. Definition of inverse function. Two functions are inverses. Oh, this looks really good. We're going to work an example here. Maybe two. Let's see how the first one goes. If two functions are inverse functions, if... For the functions f and g, f of g of x equals x for every value in x of the domain, and g of f of x equals x for every value of x in the domain. Ah, okay. So, and this says check your answer. You can click on that, and it'll open the answer where you can do this. But we'll do this one as a class. Determine the inverse of f of x equals 2x plus 2. And then we're going to prove by showing the identity function, which is what this is talking about, the definition of the inverse function. So this is going to be good. We're going to do this. I'm going to sharpen the pencil and do this right here. F of x equals 2x plus 2. All right. Got that on paper. Let's find the inverse first. So the first step, y equals 2x plus 2. Remember, that's step one. Now step two, trade places. Put the x and the y. And then step three is solve this for y. So subtract two. So we have x minus 2 equals 2y divide by 2. x minus 2 over 2 equals y. And step 4 is to rewrite. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it around so we can rewrite it this way. It equals x minus 2 divided by 2. Okay, so we found the inverse function. That's the inverse function of this original function up there. Now it wants to prove that. Prove that. So here's our proof. You're like, I thought we left proofs back behind in geometry. So everything in math has a proof. We just don't often play with it. Here is the proof that these are inverses. So let's prove by doing f of g of x and g of f of x. Okay, so first we'll do f of g of x. So if we call this g of x, which actually, I guess it's f of, let's, let's write this properly. f of in, inverse. We're going to substitute the inverse in for f, and over here, we're going to substitute f into its inverse. Let's do it that way. f f inverse, and then f inverse f. So first we're going to take f, and we're going to substitute its inverse in. So we're going to say 2 times, instead of x, we're substituting the inverse in. 2 times x minus 2 divided by 2. Okay, that's x. We substituted this in. And then there's still a plus two on the end. All right. Everyone sees what we did there, right? X minus two divided by two. We just substituted in for the X. So this became two times X minus two divided by two. All right. So let's simplify now. X minus 2 divided by 2 multiplied by 2. But if we multiply by 2 and divide by 2, those cancel each other out, right? Because if I take any number and I multiply it by 2 and then divide it by 2, I get back what I started with. So this simplifies to just X minus 2. And then we have a plus 2 in the end. Well, X minus 2 plus 2 
that just equals x. So if I substitute the inverse of x into f of x, it's simplified to just x. That's important. This is how we prove it. If we simplify it in, it has to equal x. The proof. Here, let's do it this way. Let's. The proof. The proof is that it equals x. But this also has to equal x. So let's do this one. So f inverse of f of x would be starting with this one x minus 2, but instead of x, we're going to put this in. 2x plus 2 minus 2 divided by 2. See what I did? I took the x right there. That's what I put in parentheses because that's just minus 2 divided by 2. I took the x and I put this in for x. I substituted it because that's what I said to do right here. Take f of x and substitute it in for x. So. There's nothing outside the parentheses, so that's really just 2x plus 2 minus 2 divided by 2. So 2x plus 2 minus 2. Well, those cancel each other out, right? We added 2 and subtracted 2. So that's just 2x divided by 2. Well, what's 2x divided by 2? That's just x, because 2 over 2 cancels each other out. And so f inverse of f of x also <laughs> equals x. As though you expect anything well. That's our proof. This is how you prove it. You prove it by substituting into each other, substitute that into that, and then substitute that into that. Simplify them and show that they both equal x. So these are inverses. They are inverses of each other. And this is how you prove that. And there will be a problem like this that we will do. Pretty sure there's one on the test next week. So it's important that you understand what we're doing there. The only thing that'll change is they'll probably give you f of x and g of x. So let's do this. Let's say f of x equals x to the third g of x equals the square root of x. And it asks, are these inverses of each other? Are they inverses? Well, the only way you can prove that is you got to say, all right, well, let me substitute g of x in there. So this would be the square root of x to the third power. Does that simplify to just x? No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Because the square root of x to the third power would not be x. I don't even have to check the other one. Not inverses. But if f of x was this, x squared g of x equals the square root of x and then i take f of g of x and said the square root of x squared well those cancel each other out i'm taking the square root and then i'm squaring it so that just equals x we said oh maybe they are inverses so now let's try g of f of x the square root, but instead of square root x, I got to substitute x squared, I mean, x squared in, because that's what f is. 
So the square root of x squared also equals x. The negative on the male side, not the female side. These are inverses. That's how I prove it. If it gives you f of x and g of x, you have to do this, substitute in there. If it doesn't equal x, you don't have to do the other one. There's no way, but they both have to equal x. So if you try either one and it doesn't equal x, it's not an inverse. But if it does equal x, you need to check the other one. Because if they both equal x, that proves they are inverses of one another. Let me leave that up in the screen for a moment and let you put that in your notes. But that's how you prove it. Prove that they're inverses algebraically. Algebraically. I bring that down if anybody wants to look at that up there. But that was the proof that they are inverses. All right. Let me switch back over here. But this does have the check your answer in that one that we did with the 2x plus 2. Now, when you look at the graph, they are mirror images each other over that y equals x line. That means if xy is on the graph, that means yx has to be on the graph. So let's look at this. Let me, let me kill all this. That was the 2x. All right, what was the second one we did? We did 2x plus 2. And we said the inverse was y equals x minus 2 divided by 2. That was the inverse. And again, there are mirror images over the line y equals x, that green line in the middle. It's a mirror image. So if this point, where's the point? 1, 4. If 1, 4 is on that one, we expect 4, 1 to be on there as well. There's 4, 1. If you reverse the numbers, 4, 1 and 1, 4, they're both on that graph. And it reflects over. It's a mirror image. What was the other one we said was? We said x squared and the square root of x. That's one where you have to restrict the domain, though, because the square root of x doesn't exist in the negatives. So the domain would just be x is greater, greater than or equal to 0. We had to restrict the domain because we cannot have a negative number under a square root. But still, it's a reflection over that y equals x. See that? Even though it crosses over different directions there. Uh, get rid of all the little minor lines. Okay, there we go. See, it's a mirror reflection over the line y equals x. We just had to restrict the domain. The domain is only greater than zero because of the square root. The x squared didn't care, but we're limited by the domain of whichever one's restrictive the most. All right, so that's what that's talking about, the graph of an inverse function. Mirror images. All right, here's what I'll leave for you to do for your practice. If you want to make sure you know what you're doing, x to the third minus three, find the inverse of that. And then graph it to verify. So instead of, instead of doing the equals x where you substitute, it, they're saying, now let's check it by putting it on a graph. Go to Desmos and graph this function and whatever you come up with as the inverse and see if it's a mirror over y equals x. And let me make sure this is working. You can check your answer. Is it loading? Still loading. Yeah, there it is, along with the graph. Okay, it does have the answer there. Now, here's something important. Not all functions have an inverse, an inverse function. Not all functions have an inverse function. 
So it goes, by definition, an inverse function only exists if no two elements in the domain point to the same element in the range. An example of a function without an inverse would be f of x equals x squared because 2 and negative 2 in the domain is element 4. Said so if you just looked at this. Okay. It says, does that have an inverse? If we calculate the inverse of that, that's where we had to restrict the domain. Because the, the inverse technically would be x equals y squared. See, that was the other one we did just a minute ago, but we had to restrict the domain. If we don't restrict the domain, this is not a function because it's got one one and it's got uh, one negative one. The x has two y's. So without restricting the domain, this does not have an inverse because there's more than one there's more than one uh, y for each x. So that's what I'm saying. It may not have an inverse without restricting the domain. The requirement for a function to have an inverse is that a function also must be one to one. One to one. So it says for elements A and B in the domain, if F of A equals F of B, then A equals B. So let's talk about what is that saying? One to one. That's the terminology it used. One to one. If it's one to one, each X only has one Y. And each Y only has one X. This is the important part of that. If it is one to one, each and X only has one Y and each Y only has one X. Which means if we if we list them this way, let's say we've got an x that's negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, and we were mapping them, where over here we've got zero, one, two, three, four, and we said this x went to this y, and this one went to this one, and this one went to this one, this one went to this one, and this one went to this one. Yes, that's one to one. But if one also went to three. First of all, it's not a function because one has two y's. But what if one only had zero and two also had three? Not one to one. Because three goes to zero and it goes to two. Each X only has one Y. That one only has that. That only has that. That only has that. That only has that. That has that. But that Y has two X's. Not one to one. Because if we listed all the points, we would have a duplicate number. There's going to be a question about this on the test. I remember that from last year. Something about one to one. And you're like, what? What's one to one? This is what one to one is. I would put this in my notes, one to one, and this definition. That means each X only has one Y, and each Y has only one the X. That is one to one. So it has to work both ways. Think of it as a relationship. Think of it as a relationship. If you and your boyfriend slash girlfriend are one to one, that means you're only dating them and they're only dating you. 
But if you're only dating them and they're dating three people, that's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Not a one-to-one -one relationship. Because even though you're only dating one person, they're dating three people. That's not one-to-one. -one. That's what this is talking about with X's and Y's. Each X has to only have one Y, and each Y only has to have one X. One-to-one. One-to-one. All right. If that helps you remember it, I think that's an easier way to think about one-to-one. -one. Everybody just dating one person. All right. To find the inverse function, here's those steps again. Replace f of x with y, then replace every x with a y and every y with an x, and then solve for y. So there's that steps that I listed for you on how to find the inverse. And then here's the lesson. So that was the overview. This is the overview of what we're looking at. Here is the lesson. So inverse relations and inverse functions. So this will give you more information. Inverse, the ordered pair AB also should have BA in an inverse relationship, right? Two, four, four, two. So this gives you more examples talking about while this is a function, this is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. When you see those two Ys that are the same, it tells you it won't have an inverse function. Doesn't have an inverse function. It has an inverse, but the inverse is not a function. So it doesn't have an inverse function. Horizontal line test. So the horizontal line test can show you if it has an inverse function. It doesn't have an inverse function. All right. If f is a one to one function, then the inverse function of f should be existing. And again, it gets into some math. The inverse reflection principle that talks about how when you graph it, it reflects over the line y equals x. This is the real mathy terminology. If points A, B, and B, A are in the coordinate plane are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x, then the points A, B, and B, A are reflections of each other across the line y equals x. That's the inverse reflection principle. So finding the inverse graphically. See, even with this little funky thing right there, the inverse of it is just a reflection of that red line. And this talks about the proof that we did. A function f is one-to-one -one with the inverse function g if and only if f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. Right? You have to be able to substitute one to the other and it equals X. That's what I was doing with those examples up there to prove their inverses is you substitute in. So here's some sample ones where they did that and they showed you the solutions right there. And here's the steps. So I took out that column header and I just put in here's the steps so you have that we talked about. And that's the end of the lesson. Let's look at the assignment so that goes with this. Chart. Find the inverse. So they give you this. So use those steps to find the inverse. Or maybe it's not a one-to-one -one function. So spoiler alert, this is a one-to-one -one function. So it does have an inverse. Uh, find the inverse of this function. Find the inverse of this function. Determine if this is one-to-one. -one. That's that horizontal line test. If the horizontal line will cross it more than once, it does not have an inverse function. It's not one-to-one. -one. If it doesn't touch it more than once anywhere on the graph, it is one-to-one. -one. Oh, here you go. Confirm that f and g are inverses by showing f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. So you have to do the math, not the graphing. This is the graphing question. This is the math question. So you have to substitute into one another. Look at, they're both exactly the same. Two over X and two over X. Wow. Maybe we should do a, a sample because some of you are going to get lost and go, how do I do a fraction over a fraction? Yeah, let me use this paper here. I got some room on this paper. So let's say... I'm just going to show the fraction part. Um, Let's say I've got a fraction that is 
three divided by x over three. I've got a fraction that has a fraction inside the fraction. Like that's crazy, Mr. Brock. How do I, what do I do with that? When I substitute, so I substitute in, maybe I had um, f of x was three over x and g of x was x over three. And so this is what f of g of x equals. Because instead of three over x, I took out the x and I put this in, x over three. Oh, that's not a good three. I substituted this in where the x is and I, it gave me this. Like, how do I simplify this? Now, I'll tell you, this is not going to be an inverse. So it's not going to simplify nicely. To get rid of a fraction on the bottom, you multiply by its reciprocal. But you have to multiply the top and the bottom both by that. So I did. I turned it upside down and multiply it this way. Wow. How does that work? Well, let's see. So the bottom of the fraction, what, what happens to the bottom of the fraction? Remember when you multiply fractions, you just multiply straight across. Three times X is three X. Three times X is three X. This just equals one. So this goes away then, right? Because anything over one, four over one is just four. X over one is just X. So anything over one, would go away so that gets rid of the bottom of the fraction but the top of the fraction three times three is nine x but since this is over one this goes away this simplifies to just nine over x because this went away because it was just one now notice this did not simplify to x that's nine divided by x so this is these are not inverses because it equals nine over X. That means I don't even have to check the other one. I can stop right there because the first one was not inverses because it did not equal X. It equaled nine over X. But if this would have just simplified to X, then I would need to substitute the other way and check that. But this is important part I wanted to show you. How do you get when you got a fraction inside of a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. And why can I multiply by that? Three divided by X divided by three divided by X. That's just one because it's the same thing in the numerator and the denominator. So all I did is I multiplied by one, right? This just equals one. So I took it times one. So if I multiply this times one, it still equals the same thing. It just looks different. I, I've changed how it looks, but it still equals the same thing because I only multiplied it by one. Because this is going to be the same number divided by the same number. Whatever, even if that's a real weird number. Three elevenths divided by three elevenths. If X is 11, still three elevenths divided by three elevenths is going to equal one. So it doesn't matter what X is. As long as I have the same number on the top and bottom, I'm only multiplying by one. So this is the important part I want you to get. How do you get rid of the fraction on the bottom? You multiply it by its reciprocal. Turn it upside down. So that would be 3x over 3x, which is just 1. And it goes away. The bottom goes away. So it just leaves you with the top. All right. That's how that works. That's how you get rid of it. So that's what you're doing on this. Because you got 2 over x and 2 over x. So when you substitute in, you're going to have 2 over 2 over x. You got a fraction inside of a fraction and you have to get rid of that and prove that it just equals x so, all right I'm like phew boy that looks like a mess mr brock yeah that's why i didn't want to do a third lesson this week because okay we're dealing with uh, some higher level math here fractions inside fractions that's not something we like to play with but we should be able to do it so 
if you need to go through the lesson and look at some of those examples, like I said, I left you one or two in there that you can check your answer. You know, if you're confused on this in any way, come to class Wednesday. This is a Friday B day, so I won't be here Friday in this class, but we have class Wednesday. So if you work on this before Wednesday and you're like, whoo, I am so lost on this problem, then you should come to class. If your grade's below 70, you got to come to class anyway. So maybe even then you should work ahead of time to see if you need help with this week's assignment. But that probably means you're missing some past week's assignment. You need to get those in as well. So, okay, guys, you got about 30 minutes left in class. If you want to get started on this in case you have problems, I'll stay here in class. I'll be here. I'll be in class until 1030. So if you want to get started now, you can say, okay, Mr. Brock, I'm trying this and I'm not getting it. Or if you have something else you need to work on, that's fine too. But I'll be here in class. But that's all I have for you this week. That's our entire lesson. Uh, lessons too. And uh, we'll see you Wednesday. Let's hang around and work now. I'll stop recording.